I'll start that. All right. Um, in that case, hello, everyone. Welcome to our very first uh, local offline collaboration working group monthly. Um, we're going to be just mostly spending this time uh, kind of knitting, booting our community, having uh, some introductions between different folks and what we're excited about, what we're working on, and um, maybe talk more about kind of the charter of this, this community and what we're hoping it can accomplish and what we want to get out of it. Um, so my thought was we would spend the first, you know, 10, 15 minutes um, kind of just sharing who we are, doing introductions. Um, was thinking could introduce yourselves, um, talk about what project or projects you work on, um, especially in the local offline first space, um, maybe share their favorite um, you know, use case in this area uh, or one that maybe got them really excited about the space. Um, and then uh, if, if you have feelings or thoughts, say a word or two about um, what, what you hope to get out of this, this group and community. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, my name is Molly. I'm working on IPFS and uh, specifically uh, this working group, surprise, surprise. Uh, and so thinking about all of the ways in which um, IPFS and some of the other tools in that space, like Wood P2P, IPLD, can support um, users who have intermittent or um, low bandwidth or uh, asynchronous connections to the rest of the um, like the internet, the, their networks, and how they can make the most advantage of all of these great tools that we've been developing um, to help them collaborate and work offline or in use cases where um, they, they don't have great connections. Um, so I, I'm currently in the, the stage of doing a lot of research in this space um, and trying to, to boot groups like this and participate in others. Um, Cool. Uh, so that's that's how I work on local offline first. And my favorite use case, uh, I come from an education background. So I worked in education tech for a long time. And it's the, all of the students with pretty crappy low end devices, probably like, you know, really cheap mobile phones sitting in a classroom trying to exchange information or do a you know, a fun collaborative quiz game that helps them learn that shares information with their teacher about who's getting stuff and, um, and it can do this all offline peer-to-peer um, -peer between the students in the classroom without having to have really awesome bandwidth to every single school, which we know is definitely not the case even in the most uh, wealthy of nations. So uh, that's, that's the one that gets me really excited. What I'm hoping to get out of the, this working group is, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to learn about all of the cool stuff that's happening in the space, understand what other people find really exciting, um, and then be able to to kind of share and, and get you know, iterative feedback on some of the discoveries we make throughout this research process and be able to um, talk about that as a group and come to kind of like synthesize these conclusions and bring them back to the community and be like, wow, look at this cool stuff that, that we've been discovering. Like, let's, let's continue the discussion and ideally make the local offline first uh, internet even better and support those use cases. So that's me. Um, Hector, I made, I promised I was going to make you talk, so do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, I'm Hector. I work on IPFS cluster. I, I just think the whole offline area is super interesting and we don't work on it enough. My dream use case is to be on a train and being able to install things on my computer without internet access. Just Picking them up from somewhere else, someone else, and, and that's it. I don't know if I will have much time to do things on this working group, but I'm watching the repository, so I will be following at least. Cool. Um, Dominic, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so I'm Dominic. I mostly work on Go IPFS and specifically around like platform problems. Um, mostly I'm interested in stuff like this because I come from a background where I'm very used to not having connectivity or having really awful connectivity. And while that's much better today than it was, say, 10 years ago, uh, that's not the case for the most of the world. So. Uh, I know that frustration and would like to help alleviate that if I can. So, yeah, that's me. 
Awesome. Terry, do you want to go? Sure. So my name is Terry Chadborn. I currently work as a community manager at Protocol Lab. So it's my job to try to make it easier to understand what the decentralized web is and why we would want to use it. And that includes looking for good use cases that make that easy to understand. Um, so my background before coming to Protocol Labs is as sort of a co-organizer of the broader offline first community, not specific to decentralized. I got into that because I was uh, working at a company where they used CouchDB a lot to do offline data storage and then sync PouchDB and CouchDB. Um, so while I was there, I became a co-organizer of an event called Offline Camp, which is for the broader offline first community. And at camp, I've met a lot of people who are interested in decentralized. I'd say maybe a third of the people at some of the events are interested in the decentralized web as opposed to working around the limitations of the more centralized web. Um, so I'm interested in seeing more about where where the overlap is between those two interests. I'm also the editor of a publication, it's called the Offline Camp publication on Medium. Um, and I'm always looking for articles there. I will also be launching a blog here in Q1. So I'm a good place to send <laughs> content ideas too. If you want to get something out there that's really kind of like story form or video from your conference talk or an idea you've been batting around or something cool you made that puts these things into practice. I have places to get those stories out there and I'd love to talk to people about that. Awesome. Jonathan, you want to tell us a little bit? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm not part of uh, IPFS or Planetary Labs, uh, but um, I've worked on a, a couple of projects over the years in that are centered around offline first or limited connectivity or peer connectivity. So um, I've been building out tools for uh, disaster recovery infrastructure in a project called Baculus, um, and I've tested out a couple of different uh, pieces of software and protocols and kind of landed on uh, using Scuttlebutt for that because it was the most user-friendly at the time. Um, and uh, I do a little, I'm doing like freelance product design for another offline first um, project called Project Lantern. Um, I'm also part of School for Plata Computation, which hosted the peer-to-peer -peer web MIC um, meetup last year. And uh, I volunteer for MIC Mesh. Um, and I'm there's a potential project using IPFS cluster um, that I've been working with uh, for museums in, in uh, the United States. Um, the current museum is like a kind of distributed museum where the people who are members uh, and support it get to vote on like what gets acquired and things like that. And they've been talking about how to reliably collaborate and um, acquire pieces that are pretty large files and um, make sure that they're backed up in, in multiple locations, but still private to their own cloud. So um, I've been poking and prodding on IPFS cluster, but uh, it still, it seems uh, like there's a lot to learn to get it working. Yeah. Awesome. Matt, do you want to go? Yeah, I work on, mostly focus on sort of data stewardship topics in app protocol labs. And so my interest in the offline first stuff is that ultimately an offline first application needs some way for the data to accumulate and persist over time. And that ends up being some sort of data set that needs to be stewarded and there's lots of different options on that side of how to do that in distributed ways uh, and so I, I see these two things fit, fitting together in interesting um, opportunities also there's the exciting thing that and I, this came from the first time I met Terry of uh, distributed apps and decentralized apps thus far have often been slower and clunkier and less responsive than the centralized alternative meanwhile offline first 
is often like people often go to offline first in order to make things more responsive. And so, so I'm really curious whether, where we can leverage that opportunity to flip this flow. A lot of that has to do with just like having a smarter approach to the user experience and being smart about what you synchronize when. And so I'm really curious to see where we can take advantage of that. Favorite example is an existing app called Mapeo made by Digital Democracy where they synchronize maps uh, and then in an offline context there, people like going out to places like remote regions of the Amazon, often indigenous peoples, and actually mapping their local region maybe for things where like companies are illegally logging, things like that. Um, and then uh, they choose whether to synchronize that data back to a global view because they're also doing things like marking where traditional medicines grow, which they don't necessarily want to share. And so it's like a really rich dynamic application of off offline first and where it also percolates into this topic of stewardship of data over time. Fair. And cool. I like, I appreciate your comment about the user experience because I'm in the middle of uh, editing an interview that I did with someone who's, who's big into de the decentralized community. We're talking about like all of the onboarding challenges and getting people to understand decentralized and use that stuff. And one of the things that came up was like, is the decentralized web just an inherently like user hostile model compared to the other options that are out there? So that's definitely a big challenge to overcome. Yeah, that's something um, Pedro, who is part of the um, dynamic data capabilities working group inside of IPFS, they, they spend a lot of time thinking about um, and prototyping and, and building um, apps on top of some of the IPFS tools and uh, have this this area where it's like, wow, it's not even so much the technical aspect that's really difficult in this space. It's figuring out the right UX practices and principles so that um, you can think about, all right, my document is syncing to one peer, but maybe that's not the peer I meant to be collaborating with. There is no more concept of like there's a central source of truth for how, how you might be doing like a Google Docs that's fully distributed. And so there's definitely some UX principles around yeah. offline or local first applications that are, are outside of the realm of existing patterns and paradigms that are well yeah. in what people know. Yeah, we've had people write about that in the offline camp hub. Um, Pedro came to offline camp and Jonah, who works with Jonathan on the Project Lantern, uh, also came and actually created this really nice uh, chart of like sort of design concepts around that you need to to do offline first well. Matt? I just want to flag a thing that I think will come up a lot for this group is this um, if you okay if you embrace the language of decentralized and distributed being distinct terms from that like Paul Barron paper where distributed is fully peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized is some like federated um, the value and the power of having things that are for pragmatic reasons functioning as a decentralized thing where you do have what Scuttlebutt calls pubs and like you have this notion of like hubs that people can run and rely on for reliability and connectivity and all those things but then it's all done using distributed protocols so the information is identified in a way and passed in such a way that it could be done totally distributed but for efficiency you can use these these like hubs um, I think is a thing that we'll end up leveraging more and more and figuring the getting the messaging clear on that so that people understand what's going on and they're not like, oh, that's not distributed. That's not peer to peer. Um, I think might be one of the stumbling points for, for getting people to buy in. Yeah, I think one of the really important things there is like, um, I think, don't quote me on this, but I believe like the, the classical kind of decentralized space is like, there are many nodes, but they're like very privileged, like um, ACWL nodes where it's like, oh, th this node is very different from all other nodes and no other node could step up to be this like, Kind of more um, this hub space, but if anyone can be a hub and anyone can provision a hub, like that's it, it has these distributed patterns and paradigms that we care about. But with all of the good stuff of actually, yes, being able to rely on a connection to something, um, and and having nodes maybe with more capability, more storage, like better bandwidth, stuff like that. Um, so completely agree. I think that's a really good point that uh, that we should be doing. Um, Notice that Peter jumped back on. So Peter, we uh, we spent the first. 
whatever, 10 minutes or so doing introductions. Um, if, if your bandwidth and situation permits, it would be awesome if you'd introduce yourself and um, talk a little bit about what you think about in the offline space, what use cases you care about, and what you're hoping to get out of this group. Okay, hello. My name is Peter. and I'm mostly here to listen and learn, but my interest in offline first is uh, to learn of solution or technologies that uh, we can use or I can use here to to solve a couple of um, problems local, but personally I've experienced situations uh, using web apps that I feel I wish if only it could work offline. So that got me interested in offline first and joining the offline community. And uh, I've worked with CouchDB to solve some of those problems for solutions like you for people. In terms of decentralized, I have no idea what it is, no IPFS. So I'm just here to understand uh, what it is and what um, you are trying to achieve with the offline collab working group. And that's it for me. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, maybe that's a, a good segue. I, you know, I, I think this is we're having interesting discussions and we should make sure that there's time for that here but also wanted to to talk a little bit more about kind of where where this group is heading in the short term um and so similarly to um a lot of the other working groups in the wider ipfs project we um do quarterly okrs to kind of set goals for ourselves and track some of the work that we're doing um so uh can present that um, so that folks know um, of, of those of us who are dedicating time to this working group, I think it's generally going to be an interest group with lots of folks who, um, who come and engage, but um, want people to be aware of kind of the, the work that we're doing. I believe it's this. Um, so will it be mainly for IPFS, um, where people who work for IPFS? Um, it's going to this this community is completely open, so um, definitely not uh, limited uh, to folks who work um, on IPFS or even you know are specifically focused or care about IPFS solutions. I think it's um, we're looking a lot at kind of the wider problems here, and kind of one of our big focus areas for um, Q1 and Q2 of next year is understanding the space and documenting kind of pain points with IPFS, but also pain points in the wider community and needs and kind of a taxonomy of the different um, applications that that exist and are trying to meet needs here. So definitely broader than um, specific IPFS tooling. Um, so if you can see, I'm actually presenting my, uh, my screen right now. Thumbs up, all good. Um, awesome. And so we have uh, a place on GitHub which documents this group, which maybe some of you guys saw. And um, we have an open issue about our Q1 OKRs. And kind of the, the main three goals um, we're focused on for Q1 is you know, forming this community first off and like making sure this is a place that's, um, that's useful and we're, we're bringing um, interesting discussions and having, uh, pushing like this project forward, um, but also doing research and understanding kind of, of all of the, the folks who are engaging with IPFS and in the wider um, community, what are some of the um, development pain points? So UX is a good one that we brought up having like this more decent, decentralized versus fully distributed model and being able to um, have nodes that step up to like give the reliability and connectivity aspect is another good one. Like um, surfacing and documenting those pain points and the common solutions um, and tools that people use in order to um, make decentralized apps work really well for this offline or local first collaboration case. Um, and then finally, forming and finding relationships throughout the community. Um, Terry's gonna be doing some work in um, the offline first space, organizing offline camp. Um, and I think in general, there's a lot of interest to, to talk more with people to document best practices and make sure that as we boot this community, we're following those um, to make sure we spend our time really effectively. So um, if, if folks have ideas or input, um, I think right now it's, um, Terry, Pedro, and me who are starting to drive this forward. Um, but 
as if people want to kind of contribute or want to talk more about some of these topics or volunteer for some areas, um, we're super open to it. Uh, that'd be that'd be awesome. Um, curious if anyone has thoughts or feedback on kind of these focus areas or recommendations for us as we kind of kick things off. So uh, I think a couple of the areas where we have kind of like explicit open questions, um, I don't know, I think I wrote this in the doc, um, are kind of like what, who are the research orgs maybe that we should be reaching out to that are actually actively doing user research in this space because um, we want to learn from their understandings and knowledge. Um, Matt, I know you have a couple of connections like um, Nicholas Pace, right, was, was one of the folks that you're connected with who's um, like, you know, in the field, understanding pain points actively in um, kind of doing offline collaboration and, and trying to have more mesh networking tools. Um, curious if anyone else is familiar with some folks that, you know, we can just source a, a list of people we should start reaching out to and see if there's opportunities to collaborate. Matt, go ahead. Well, there's all the, the people at Digital Democracy who made Mapeo. They use DAT, uh, and I think it would be good to sync with them and learn about why they use that and not IPFS and also but just more generally in their understanding of the use cases they've tackled. That'd be awesome. Thank you. It's a great recommendation. Yeah, I've also heard a lot more about that than about IPFS within off folks at offline camp which I don't know what the technical differences are that make that the case but I there are certainly a lot of people in the that community that are doing like data science-y type things um, or oh, I guess I'm trying to think the, you know like I know people who are heavily involved in Scuttlebutt which is a different like social networking people who have helped to build Mastodon um, but yes I know many people. <laughs> I can tell you which camp attendees care about decentralized more than others, but also going to the offline camp hub and clicking on that decentralized tab is a place to see some of the folks who've written about it and what topics they've written about in that connection of that overlap. Um, yeah. And I'm going to need to jump in a couple of minutes because I have another call, but it's great to meet everybody. Thank you for um, attending. Go ahead, Jonathan. So, so uh, as part of like School for Product Computation, uh, which I put a link in the notes for, Tay and Choi has been working on kind of a longstanding project called the Distributed Web of Care. And I'll, you know, I don't want to speak for him too much, um, but nice. the one of the ideas that he talks about a lot, and like I, I helped, he had. Um, kind of two students that were working under him for a separate project. And some of the ideas around distrib distributed uh, technologies and decentralized technologies was not about the technology itself, but about the communities that they create. So thinking about um, kind of higher level, like, okay, the tech could be decentralized or distributed, and it talks about node privilege but there's also like communal privileges and um, I don't know, they've just been doing like a lot of really deep thinking about that and I can connect you to them. And um, similarly, I saw a lot of representation for DAT and a little bit around Scuttlebutt um, when they hosted the peer to peer web conference, which had probably the most amazing opening of any conference, uh, any technology conference I've been to. Uh, what was that? I don't, so we started, um, we were passed around like a little card with a spell on it. And we, everyone in the room cast a spell. And that spell mm -hmm. was um, taking back our creative and energies from centralized like communities like Instagram and, and Twitter and, and all that. And uh, as we were saying it, it was being fed into a microphone to create entropy for uh, a shared key that we were all given to commemorate that moment together. So like wow. we all have a private key 
you know, I don't know. It was just like pretty wild and um, kind of set the tone for like, it, it kind of stopped people from being like, that's not decentralized enough or that's not perfectly distributed. You know, like people were starting to think about more um, impactful things. So yeah, their research is good. That's awesome. I, I will go and I, I was not familiar with this P2P web conference, so I'll go watch some of the, hopefully they have published recordings of, of some of the talks from there. That sounds like a useful place to start. Uh, they might not have any recordings, but I'll, I'll talk to Taeyun about um, kind of the ephemera that came out of it and, and see if I can get some more uh, if they have something private. Arkady and I both went, we were both there. I don't remember a camera. So I don't know if they recorded it. Cool. Well, Matt, if you have any um, any notes, or if either of you guys have any any notes or takeaways, I would love to hear more about it. It sounds really cool. A lot of the same things were presented in this, the the Dweb Summit session for DAT. Anyone go to the the thing that um, was hosted after? D web like uh, by, um, I think it was pseudo room. Someone told me that there was like a pseudo room after D web chat. That was like two days long. Not familiar. Yeah, I, th I think I think a lot of the people who couldn't afford D web. Um, the pseudo room kind of just last minute was like, hey, you know, we, we can give you space and like a platform and, and chat. Um, but I don't, I don't know many people who went, maybe like, I think Caroline Sanders might have gone, um, who's a, a researcher on, um, who deals a lot with like, how to build better UX to deal with online harassment, which is, mm -hmm. um, kind of a interesting question for uh, communities like Scuttlebutt, for example, where like you only see the data of people you follow and people they follow. And like, how does, how does that interact with like the idea of um, censoring or, or dealing with harassment? Um, they had a really big problem with online identity uh, early on that was supposed to be a, uh, it was supposed to help against harassment, but it, it, it actually didn't. Um, but anyway, that's getting into the weeds of things, so. Yeah, I'm curious, like, I definitely see, um, like, the UX challenges of trying to, of, of not having centralized applications as being a big challenge for developers who are kind of coming in and trying to build bottoms up for kind of a, the offline or local first collaboration model where it's like, great, my application should be just as powerful when people are not connected to any central server as, um, but like with a subgroup of people that they want to collaborate with or communicate with. Um, so I see a lot of challenges there. I see a lot of challenges around like the persistence connectivity side. Um, curious, like identity seems like something that is also super challenging in the kind of distributed decentralized model. I'm, I'm not quite sure about the intersection with offline. So I'm, if anyone who's thought about that more would be curious about your your thinkings about, you know, offline first and identity and if there's additional challenges over just decentralized, um, it, when we start thinking about like people who have like sporadic connectivity and stuff like that. Uh, most of the, uh, most of the offline or peer-to-peer -peer communities that I've interacted with have less problems with identity verification because they're physically closer to each other and the communities are smaller. So um, that's kind of one of the places where it ends up being slightly better is that if you feel like a more tight-knit group because you are a smaller group and you're not broadcasting the behavior, um, I mean, it still has like, problems of implicit power structures and, and, and people having different expectations that aren't like written out. Um, but they're much easier to deal with when things go wrong because you, you're not like appealing to something that's massive or faceless or distant um, to 
moderate for you. Uh, so actually, I think ad identity verification um, might be easier with peer-to-peer -peer or offline stuff. That's good insight. Thank you. There's Matt? also, I mean, like possibly the most successful offline first use case is Git. It, Git is offline first and you use it locally and then you choose to sync it to, but GitHub is actually not even part of Git. The centralized thing is not even part of the Git application or its protocol. Um, and so if you think about that and how you identify, you sign, you optionally sign your commits with Git and then that deals with the authentication thing because it's like, it just boils down to your standard web of trust stuff. Do I trust stuff signed using that private key? And I think a lot of a lot of your sort of offline use cases, if you do want to grapple with identification, boil down to that. It's like it reinvokes the kind of web of trust problem. Absolutely. I'm curious if anyone um, kind of switching gears a little bit. Talk about let's talk about our favorite um, tools or existing. Um, folks who are operating in kind of the offline first, local first, uh, decentralized collaboration space, um, just as, as to get a sense of like those things that exist out there that we think are doing a really good job um, or ones that um, maybe are like well-known and popular. Um, and we can talk a little bit, you know, that gives us a sense of what is the, the gamut of applications that exist out there that are trying to do cool stuff um, and some folks that maybe we can talk to about best practices and um, what has made them so successful and their key insights in, in getting the, either that popularity or um, building tools in a really good, uh, well-designed way. So do folks have, have ones that come to the top of their head? I mean, that's initial, like, hey, f fork this web page and make your own is really solid. That that UX of working with a bunch of people who haven't done programming before or, like, uh, artists that just want to publish a zine and feel, like, not even think about the text so much, you know, telling them, okay, op open this web browser and find a page you like and then make it your own is feels pretty powerful. Um, that, that one's pretty good. And Scuttlebutt, if you're in the same room as someone else, feels amazing. Like if you open it up and you don't have an internet connection or you're like connected to the same router, but you're not, you know, joining a pub or doing that dance. If someone just says here, have, you know, here's a USB key, open this. And now you can like chat with people and you could look at history and, and um, that first time sync if you're in the same room together feels really good. If you just go to the website and try and like connect to the network, it feels awful, I think. Awesome. Any others, Matt, Dominic? I, uh, I suppose there's that, um, what are they called? Pirate box. There's like little lunch boxes people make that, uh, they leave around and it's just a Wi-Fi access point that people can connect to and it's got a ton of weird services on it like you can host files on it there's chat and all that stuff and it is not only offline first but I guess it would be offline only in that the little Wi-Fi boxes don't connect to any any other networks precisely Air, airdrop also feels pretty great. Yes. It's like so smooth. Yeah, you just click on something on the sidebar and you can send it to people. Um, you can kind of, you can kind of uh, not abuse airdrop, but abuse uh, what is it called? MDNS. Um, bonjour. So like, I made a chat application that forces itself into everyone's Finder. Um, so you can like, it's the only local chat that doesn't require an install um, where you can broadcast, hey, I have a file share here. And the file share name could be whatever text you want. And then if someone clicks on it, there's just a file. And if they edit the file, 
then that becomes a new share name. So I kind of had this like really weird ping pong chat room that, you know, whenever anyone's connected to the same Wi-Fi and they open up Finder, they can start a conversation. But it's it's kind of amazing that they have airdrop, but not like air chat, where, you know, it would be the same thing. That I'd like to see without having to install stuff. Airdrop also highlights the things that can go wrong. I mean, it's not always smooth. When it works, it's beautifully smooth. But when it doesn't work, it's sort of like baffling. And like, I've had comical scenarios, like a friend trying to share three photos with me, and managed to share it with the 10 other people at the table. We never, got, we never managed to get it from his phone to mine. Weird. Yeah, I think the case that drives me crazy in those is like, ah, oh, but like, it, it it needs to work between everyone. And I have this moment where I'm like trying to transfer to someone with Android and I'm like, yep. I'm so sorry, but I have nothing for you. Mm -hmm. One that comes to mind from, from kind of like my, my area of passion is um, the work that Khan Academy Light is doing around um, distributing kind of all of the, the Khan Academy videos um, and, and I believe some of the tooling as well for teachers and students around kind of tracking student progress through watching a number of, of offline videos. Um, I think they have a, a more manual process of kind of um, interfacing directly with schools and getting the set up and having servers. So it's definitely not, not smooth, but um, love the, the capability to bring all of that content to the edge of the network and make it really accessible to um, groups who would not be able to have that sort of kind of flipped learning model given their bandwidth, their infrastructure capabilities. Has anyone tried using um, F-Droid's USB capabilities? Like, I know that you don't need to connect to a central repository on F-Droid to share files. And there was like someone at the, um, Mozilla did like a challenge uh, with the NSF last year. Uh, why, like it, the nickname is Wins, W-I-N-S. Um, and one of the finalists for that had like built a sneaker net for like a sneaker net app store on top of F droid. They just like made a repository for tools that, um, are offline first so that, you know, they don't just, uh, yeah, I think it was just a repository of filtered tools for offline first and, and the video showed people just being like, all right, plug this USB stick into your Android phone and now you can install apps and you can chat with people and that, but I don't, I don't know how well it actually worked. Interesting. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I use F droid and, uh, while it has the capabilities, you can, you can share packages over Bluetooth with other people that already have F droid installed. Um, I've never met another Android user that wants a free package from my phone, so I've never <laughs> tested it, but it supposed, supposedly can do that. So uh, how hard is it? SP, though. How hard is it right now, Dominic, for you and I to pretend to be on the same network and send like my favorite F Droid app to you or vice versa? You know, like why is that's another thing I, I've I've used Ngrok for like command line, uh, you know, web server testing, but nothing, setting up a VPN seems really painful too. Especially too, because we don't, like it's not over LAN. We would have to do it over, I guess, serial, like Bluetooth serial. Um, however, I know that someone in our organization has a working version of a repo hosted through IPFS. So in theory, if we both installed that fork, we could send packages to each other over the network, but how we would know about each other, like getting the identity down of like, I want Jonathan's stuff. Um, that, that doesn't seem like it's solved yet, unless, it's, unless you manually add everything. Like I'd have to add your repository and stuff. Um, 
with the Nintendo Switch, it has a really awful story for um, adding friends. Uh, they give you a UUID, you put it in, and then it connects through their servers. But they have they have something that was popular maybe 10 years ago where uh, you could bump two phones together and based on the timestamp of when two people hit the API, it was like, okay, you two are the closest. It's probably these two people. So they they just show, I think it's like playing card suits or icons that are some sort of hash. Um, I don't know what we would do, you know, I mean, in this chat, we would want to just send a URL because it's something we can click on, right? But, but then what happens? So something uh, related to this that me and Molly talked about a while ago was um, the Nintendo DS, where they had the street pass stuff. Um, I'm a big fan of that concept, but I never really hear that talked about. Um, I think that's brilliant for offline first identity stuff. The, the concept is simply that two people have devices and if they walk near each other enough so that the radios can communicate, um, all it does is tell you that later. So when you go home, you say, oh, I, I, you know, if I walked by you, it would say, oh, you walked by Jonathan today. Would you like to add them as a contact and vice versa? So like totally no interaction, like human interaction. We just have to be near each other and we can accrue this like list of people. And then that also like syncs data over that. So the next time you're near them, it's like um, almost like a data courier service. Uh, but you could also just use that to transmit that UUID and then have network capabilities around that, if that makes sense. Some of the stuff Nintendo does with offline stuff is really interesting. And just, I think a lot of people don't focus on it, I guess, because it's a game console or something. At, um, at our networks, which I put a, a link up in the uh, meeting notes, which is a really warm and wonderful um, kind of very similar to this, like offline first uh, conference. They And they were actually streaming video over IPFS, which was cool. Is that um, the one in Toronto, State of Our Networks? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I missed the conference part, but they had three days afterwards for like hacking, and I, I made it to that. Um, one of the people there had started to design similar to Street Pass. Um, he wanted to do street pass for posters. So the idea was like he wanted to walk down the street and have other people who had just like low quality pictures of shows that were going on in the next week, like that were local, just to show up in his phone and be able to like scroll a feed of things that that were essentially advertisements, but ones that he cared about. Um, and we looked into like, how low level can you, how can you send data to a phone without connecting to that phone via ad hoc, right? Like you don't want to set up an access point and, and connect um, and setting up for like meshing is not that great. Um, but you can, you can stuff like advertisement packets um, into like 802.11 or you can use a side channel like Bluetooth, which is how uh, which is how the initial negotiation for uh, uh, AirDrop works, right? So you discover each other over Bluetooth, but then you transfer using Wi-Fi Direct. That is, you know, I'd like to see that happen just to be able to passively share with people who physically were near you um, without draining a ton of battery. If possible. Yeah, that definitely seems like the. Sorry to jump in. Please. Uh, that that seems like, if anything, probably the biggest challenge with this stuff is like, as soon as we nail the concepts down, at the end of the day, it's like we have to figure out how to make this power efficient, or nobody's going to want to use it, um, or more importantly, nobody's going to want to sync that data or relay that data. Um, also, quick shout out, one more thing for the list. Um, I don't know if this counts, but sync thing, something I use a lot. It's basically like Dropbox, but self-hosted um, and a little bit less friendly, but it, it's, it works. It's good. 
something to look into maybe. Sounds awesome. Yeah, I wanted to spend maybe the, the last 10 minutes um, talking a little bit more about use cases. Um, so when Dominic and I, um, as part of, we had a Go IPFS Hack Week, um, spent a while talking about kind of the various different use cases and trying to like bucket them and organize them. Um, and kind of the, the place we got to was kind of three high level categories. Um, would love us to, to like stress test them and see if we can think of other areas that maybe don't fit within those um, buckets. But we had kind of one around the the education enterprise space, which is you have people who are um, collaborating on a project together in a space and maybe they have intermittent access or they just have a, a thin bandwidth connection and they want to be able to sync a lot of their edits and changes and files locally before maybe persisting to some some server that's going to stick around for a long time and make sure they have replication. But for example, if two people are editing a document or chatting or something, they care about the latency to each other um, much more than they care about the latency outward to a network of far off um, computers or centralized servers. Um, and you don't, they don't want to relay through that far away um, server. Um, so that was kind of like one use case. And there's like a number of, of sub use cases in that space, things like chat and document editing and um, a lot of stuff in there. Um, then there was a use case around kind of just like peer to peer file transfer. And this is kind of the airdrop style. Like I want to send you this file. I want to send you this photo. Um, I want to get this photo. Like, how do I get it? Could it be passed through people to me? Um, but like trying to, to um, move content around that way. Um, and then finally, the last one was kind of this um, kind of somewhere in between, which is like, it's like a local social um, kind of collaboration thing, but like with kind of dense networks or stuff that's like more relevant in your local community. And it kind of brushes up against the, the education uh, enterprise case, but it's more around like kind of maybe gaming or um, community networks or um, like social social sites that are more locally relevant where you could imagine that people in um, in areas have have similar some to some extent similar interests in the most popular video content or um, local news or stuff like that um, and so how how do you help or like crowds and communicating within crowds of people at say a conference or um, a concert or something like that um, so th those are kind of the high level categories we came up with and it seems like there's a lot of stuff curious if if people either have ideas or um, use cases they are familiar with that don't seem to fit well into one of those, um, or want to thumbs up one area in particular as being like, this one's actually really important and where folks should be spending a lot of their, their time early because it's gonna be the most um, powerful or the most heavily needed. I mean, I said it earlier that I'm working on a museum project and uh, on disaster recovery. So those two are very different use cases. Uh, disaster recovery cares about um, uh, wayfinding first, which might be a little outside the realm, but might, maybe not. Um, just being able to say, where is this thing? And then uh, that's the initial couple of days, like people just care where things are and, and who has checked in where. And then for long-term relief, one of the cares is um, coordination and authenticity uh, and being able to make it easy for different groups of people to have some sort of verification or signatures of good data and like maybe not so good data, um, you know, so, uh, social proof is kind of important in that sense. And then for the museums, they're, they're pretty weird. Um, they really care about, I mean, I don't know if this is a weird thing, but uh, they really care about like uh, his, history. Uh, there, there's a word for it, like the audit trail of how things go from A to B or C to D. So like if you want to, um, you know, lend a digital piece to someone else and then get it back. And you want to verify that the data you got back is 100% bit for bit correct, but they have this idea that like, um, that lawyers agree with uh, that like, even if the data is the same, 
the metadata around it, the history that it went somewhere and came back is important. So it's kind of this contentious, like, you know, if every bit is exactly the same, then there's no way technically to differentiate it from where it came from. Right. Um, yeah. but you know, that, that, that's why like content address thing works. Um, but what they care about is, oh no, 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 we went to you for three months and this event happened and, um, you got yeah. some value out of having this thing during that yeah. event. And therefore the fact that it was there matters. Yeah. And, and like, oh, you know, ownership, uh, and like time stamping tend to move away from decentralized solutions and more towards like central authorities. Um, so if there is a way to have like distributed signatures that matter or something like that, um, that, that'd be pretty interesting. Uh, and then they also care about just only sharing their data with other institutions. They will trust each other to house data for backups, but they will not trust, um, you know, Dropbox or, or Google or whatever. So there's kind of like the, the use case that seems pretty well accepted, but I haven't seen anyone do it well besides Space Monkey, um, which is you have a hard drive and some amount of it's reserved for other people's data and the same for you and, you know, hope that you can recover it. Interesting. Yeah, I think the, the this idea of like time stamping of stuff was like um, spent like just a couple hours on a weekend trying to build a fully decentralized um, game on top of IPFS. And we were trying to do Bug House, which is this timed collaborative chess game. Um, and, and so you have like timers on, on different chess boards and then you have four peers that are playing chess at the same time. And it was like, wait, hold on. How, how do the timers move? And what if people disconnect? How do we know whether they've disconnected or other people have disconnected? Do we boot people at some time? It was just like this entire problem of like, wait, synchronizing state and among four people when no one is the source of truth. And, and eventually we were like, there are hard questions here. We're gonna choose an easier game without timing. But, all right, thanks Hector. Uh, but yeah, that, it'd be really interesting for the, the museum case where they care a lot about time stampings of like, well, who's, who is the authority for time stamps? Like whose time? Um, that's, that's a really interesting case. Dominic, do you have any? Uh, pet use cases or, or things that you think are strategically valuable to, to push on? Uh, I don't know about strategic, but uh, I, I know that personally, the thing I'm most interested in seeing, like I think this has the most authenticity, is um, I like the idea of just places that don't have connectivity, just flat out, not bad, but like don't have it. I love the idea of syncing data to them. How do, how do they get updates to stuff efficiently? How do you physically get it there? All that stuff. Um, to me, that seems really important for like in countries that are not at risk of anything at the moment, but still don't have connectivity that helps them grow. And then for like disaster situations, you know, that, that helps the relief there, I feel like. So that's something that's an opinion, I guess. Yeah. Dom, uh, Jonathan, I'd be curious. Um, you know, in, I took a, a peek at Project Lantern because um, I think it was mentioned in the offline first community chat. And so I was, I was looking around through it and it seems super cool. I'm curious how like the data, like you have all of these like hotspots that are distributed around, like how do those get disseminated? Is like someone like actively going and setting up a network in a certain area um, and like, you know, other other stuff in that disaster relief space of like getting data to people and doing the, the authenticity verification you were talking about. So uh, I, I don't want to badmouth my new employer uh, or w one of my clients, however you want to describe it, or partners or collaborators. Um, it's kind of a new thing, me working with them. Everything has space for improvement. So yeah. we'll caveat that like we talk about the stuff that doesn't work well in the case of like we want to go and make it better and we need to understand it to make it better. Exactly. So um, Project 
Lantern, uh, as I understand it, there there's a lot of people on the team, um, and I have only met like three. Uh, so maybe there's around 30 people who are somewhat involved, and I don't know if they're involved like as just a collaborator or a researcher or an intern or, 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 or working for them, but I know we have a lot of researchers at McGill University who's working with us, and a lot of the research that I've seen has been um, on like feedback and UX and, and technology, and uh, the field research the only person I know who's on the team who has done field research was the founder, and uh, I haven't talked to him a lot about it. So my general understanding of the state of how this gets deployed is like, literally, we're going to be doing our first, you know, 15 plus node test deployment just to see is the base good enough for us to hand this over to people and and actually find out where those rough edges are. Um, similarly, the, the project that I worked on also for that wins challenge, Vaculus, um, it never... Vaculus? Uh, uh, <laughs> Vaculus, that, yeah, I gotta <laughs> I pick like a better a, one. Uh, someone, someone recently, they created um, some like YouTube clone or something and they called it like, um, oh, something awful, vitriol. And Ooh, it's like, oh, yeah, that's a terrible name. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe accurate, but like terrible. Yeah, no, uh, Baculus was just the code name that stuck, which is really bad. I need to get, I need to remember that names just always stick. Um, but Baculus, gotcha, I see it. Yeah, so it's just like a backpack. Um, the, the data, how the data gets to it, uh, we, we didn't distribute any data that wasn't already on like the SD card, right? So the idea is like, uh, it's almost ingest only. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not seeding it with like, we, we seeded it with some map data because that was small and easy to do. Um, but that map data came from the internet at some point. So like it, you needed to have some connection, but once you were on the network, files um, were shared from each other. And I don't know if it was important or not, but any single backulus node could create, could bootstrap another node. So like if you had one Raspberry Pi with an SD card and you plugged into the USB port, uh, another SD card reader writer, it would automatically burn a second image and make a peer node and do all that bootstrapping so that you wouldn't need to connect upwards again. Um, that's fun. awesome. That is, <laughs> I think that's huge. Like that's actually a, a thing when we talk about IPFS nodes, it's like, okay, well, I really would like it if all of the people in my space had IPFS nodes so that I could be pulling content from them and they could be pulling content from me and we'd all be this happy little, you know, offline IPFS family, then it's like, well, but we need to be doing this node bootstrapping where like, maybe I come in with this, but no one else does. How do I get them IPFS if they don't already have it? Say yeah. we're on an airplane together or something. How do we bootstrap? That's phenomenal. I love that you guys built that. Um, but that, that was just fun and exciting for me to create. And like, you're like, yes, we need this bootstrapping solved. Um, but there was no, uh, there was no research validation that required that. You know, um, and, and another, like, as a counterpoint, the, the Lantern, Project Lantern, one of the kind of groups of people that we care about are first responders, which have a very different set of um, resources available to them and concerns available to them. So for them, bootstrapping from one to, node to another isn't super important because they can come in with a package of bootstrap nodes already. Um, is, is the thought. Um, for me, I, I was very bottom up in my personal values and goals because I don't think uh, airdropping in a solution ever works. Uh, but uh, that's a side thing. Um, well, the more, the more you could make that solution available and accessible before you physically send people, like, I think it depends what um, 
what your use case model is, right? Like if, if this is like, oh, these are first responders who are coming in, like in the amount of time it takes up to deploy a first responder movement and the size of something mm -hmm. that will merit a first responder movement versus say, you know, a school with all of their Wi-Fi that's gone out for the day. Like no one is going to send in a first responder team of this. Yeah. They're going to have to figure something out on their own. Yeah, I, I think um, Scuttlebutt's uh, bootstrapping story is amazing. Also, uh, if you're in the same room together, um, I, I have to run, but thanks for putting this together and uh, I'll see you around. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll have another one in January. So I'll send out a, another ping then. Thanks for attending. This was great. Yeah. Uh, Dominic, I think we'll we'll then end it here since it's just the two of us left. Um, I feel like we have a lot of good good stuff to work on, a lot of stuff for me to go and research, and maybe I'll um, share back some of my findings um, after learning more about some of the tools that were mentioned um, for the next one. I think it's middle of January, so it's good. Have sounds good. Awesome. Happy holidays and. Um, for all of our async viewers, thanks for, for attending and we'll catch you on, on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.